the Internet and Mobile Association of India. My name is Sri Raj Deshmukh and I will be your host for this session, which is on journalistic freedom. I would like to introduce you uh, to the session moderator, Mr. Venkatesh HR, who is the director at Boom Factor. We welcome you, Mr. Venkatesh. And now I would like to welcome the panelists for the session. Ms. Dhanya Rajendran, Editor-in-Chief at the News Minute. Mr. M. G. Radhakrishnan, Editor, Asia, Asia Net News Network. And last but not the least, Mr. Siddharth Vardarajan, Founder Editor of The Wire. Now I would like to hand things over to Mr. Venkatesh to kick start this session. Over to you, Mr. Venkatesh. Mute. Yeah, mute. mute. Okay. Hi. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this discussion on press freedom at Pop Vision 2021. And it seems to me that every two to three months, the situation around press freedom has changed or changes in India. It changes minutely, but there's this incremental. Uh, you know, intolerance, chilling effect, creeping intolerance, all of that happens. And the landscape sh shifts kind of subtly every few months. And so what's the latest? We're going to take stock and then we're going to uh, take this forward. And uh, I know we've all introduced, uh, our panelists have been introduced, but we have a panel here that covers many areas. So I thought I should point that out. Uh, digital is covered, TV news is covered, print journalism is also covered. Uh, our panelists also represent so-called national media and so-called regional media. I use the word so-called because the identities, I mean, these things are blurring, right? Especially in the digital sphere. They also represent English media and non-English media in India, which is very, very crucial. And all three have had the honor, I should say, or distinction of having been at the receiving end of those who want to restrict press freedom in one way or the other. So I thought we could structure this discussion around three large bu buckets. The first would be attacks on press freedom through legal means or the legal systems, that is various laws, maybe provisions under the constitution, actions by the police, state governments, central governments, and so on. The second bucket would be censorship through the mob or through society and culture, through attacks, troll attacks on journalists uh, with the attempt to silence them. And the third, maybe we could talk a little bit about violence, physical violence against journalists. And India is unlike other countries that are designated as not free, we are designated as partly free by Freedom House. So which means in some ways we have a lot of press freedom and in some ways we rival dictatorships for the lack of press freedom. So keeping that in mind, my first question is to you Siddharth, the wire has had a fourth FIR registered against it by the UP police. Now, this obviously is not, uh, you're not new to FIRs, you've had dozens of them, but how is this different this time? Uh, is it because of the pandemic? Is the UP police being so, um, acting with so much alacrity? Is that different? Uh, thanks for uh, uh, having me and thanks for the question, um, Venkatesh. In the media, we have been accustomed to cases, civil and criminal, and these have traditionally been the primary um, vehicle for legal pressure on, uh, on journalists, editors, on media houses, publishers, and so on. And <clears throat> this goes back many decades, but sadly, the use of defamation, civil and criminal, I feel uh, has increased over the past decade, decade and a half. Companies, politicians, and others increasingly resort to filing defamation cases, and uh, media houses, the all, or which lack uh, uh, monetary resources, the big media houses, uh, have to struggle to do with this. Kind of and we've had our fair share. The wire stuff. And uh, between uh, 2050 till about 2019, uh, the or the first five years, uh, we had um, you know uh, something like 10 or 11 cases, civil and criminal, uh, in which damages running into over 10,000 crore rupees were being 
uh, claimed from us, money that we don't have. Obviously, but these are these are frivolous cases, and uh, you know uh, we have developed a certain way of handling those. What's happened, which is new over the past one year, uh, and we have noticed this, and other media houses and other journalists have noticed this too, is the widening of the ambit of coercive action by by the state. Uh, beyond that envisaged information, there is no, you know, danger okay. that a defamation case poses to the exercise of media freedom is not as high as if you are going to subject journalists to arrest on, uh, under different charges. And I think somewhere down the road, the penny seems to have dropped with gov with state governments because they've been there's a rash set of the pandemic. As you said, we have four cases now by the Uttar Pradesh police. But I say that over. So that, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if you can hear the me. Uh, there is a problem with the audio uh, and video. Uh, Marshal Pradesh or Gujarat. I can. Okay. Um, right. I mean, continue, I, but I'm going to uh, also I, paraphrase what you say. Okay. So, uh, uh, so there's been a rash of cases against um, journalists from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, so to speak, including the Andamans, uh, where uh, simply for, for reporting um, on social media, uh, a strange policy of the police on quarantine, uh, um, a journalist was, uh, was arrested, was charged and arrested by the Andaman and Nicobar police. And we've seen examples in, in Coimbatore with uh, Examples in Maharashtra, you know, pretty much in every corner of the country. And the two places worst hit are Kashmir and Manipur, where serious charges from sedition to the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act have been slapped on or threatened on journalists, all because of the professional work that they do as reporters. In Delhi, the Delhi police, uh, you know, crossed the Rubicon in January this year when they filed sedition charges against, uh, 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 you know, uh, Mrinal Pandey, senior editor, Rajdeep Sardesai and others, simply for reporting the claim of protesting farmers that one of their uh, supporters had, who had died during the protest had been, had died because of a bullet wound. And this was deemed to be seditious. Uh, uh, senior journalist Vinod Dua was charged with sedition. So I think this represents a qualitatively new in the media freedom. And the aim, you know, by threatening, the aim is clearly to uh, silence, intimidate. Uh, and I don't, think, I don't think we should rule out the intention is also to lock up. So, so uh, you know, these cases need to be taken very seriously. And uh, uh, you know they need to be opposed, and it, they are being opposed by by the media fraternity. They're being seen for what they are, and illegitimate uh, assault on the freedom of press that the government guarantees. And uh, so we we are among those who are being targeted. For some reason, the Uttar Pradesh yes. police and the Yogi Adityanath government yeah. have, has special love for us, and so we have four cases in the last fourteen months. But we aren't the only ones. And yes. uh, I think that uh, yes. uh, you know we need to uh, unite as a as a fraternity to say that this attempt to criminal report because at, you know, at, at the at the at the root of these cases is the, the state government or police's unhappiness or dissatisfaction with a news report which gives a version of events that is different from the old one. So if you but, are going to criminalize but, the creation of a vote, to the police, then I'm afraid we kiss goodbye to journalism in this country. Got it. Uh, very, uh, you know, strongly put and very clearly articulated, Siddharth. Thanks for that. Dania, I want to 
ask you a related question, but also a slightly different question. So the first, of course, is I would like you to uh, react to what Siddharth has just said. He says there's a new phase against journalism, and you also represent the Digipub Association. So you wear two hats, uh, in a sense, right? So my question is, do you have any comment for what Siddharth has just said about how things have just taken a more chilling turn in the recent past? And related to that is, of course, on the one end, you have legal means and the intent to criminalize journalism. At the other end, that whole thing is underpinned by this massive public opinion or the manipulation of public opinion to become more hostile against journalism. So you face not only legal and uh, challenges at one end, at the other end, you're also facing trolling, organized trolling and harassment. So I'd like you to comment on both things. Dhania, Dhania, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I don't know how after one year we still forget to unmute because we should all be very used to this now, right? So uh, what I want to say is that, uh, see, it's the UP government, any other state governments, but not, no one as severe as the UP government and of course the union government, they have a strategy in place now. One is, of course, to, uh, for the, to create that noise on social media, to make sure the ecosystem talks about these so-called media houses, which all, are always putting fake news according to them. So on one end, they make sure that there is some public anger, that there is manipulation of facts, that they present these media houses as some sort of villain against the country's unity, etc. On one end, they do that. On the other end, they use the law, they use the police and whatever other medium to actually intimidate, uh, to file cases. Now, uh, uh, what Siddharth explained, what I want to add is that government filing defamation cases is nothing new. We have seen that in the past many times with many state governments and even the central governments doing it. But what we found very surprising in this Ghaziabad case, even when the farmers protests happened, is that the cases, especially against the wire, are simply for reporting versions. For example, they put out the version of the Ghaziabad victim. Now, if the police are saying that the Ghaziabad victim was lying, that's for the police to take it to the court and prove it to, uh, uh, otherwise. But to simply file a case against a media house for reporting a version. There are two versions of every story, or maybe three or four versions. They reported one version. To actually file a case, I would say it's nothing less than intimidation. And uh, as you said, uh, HR Venkatesh, it's happening at many levels. First, the government, uh, people who are part of the government, which includes IAS officers, ministers, everyone, they make sure there is a lot of discussion on social media. They, they make sure a lot of anger is targeted on the uh, media houses. The second, of course, they file cases. They make uh, they make sure police file cases. And the third is, is this whole plan to make sure that the credibility of the media house is eroded. And I think the first two is to make sure the third happens. And and uh, un understood. And Danya, what would you say to this? It's a slightly related topic, as I said, the, the chilling effect, effect of harassing public at large, being encouraged to harass individual journalists. I mean, recently you had that article read by a reporter who wrote a piece on federalism, and now she's being trolled. And she says that when she wrote for The Wire, for example, she wasn't trolled so badly. So. Uh, there is a gender aspect as well, as you said, Anya. So, would you like to uh, comment on that? Maybe uh, they anyway expect the article on bias, so they don't troll so much. But yes, there is definitely a gender aspect. I mean, I I'm sure women journalists uh, get face the brunt of it on social media and elsewhere. I mean, M G Radha Krishnan, who's on the panel, can tell you how women journalists in his organization uh, are always at the receiving end compared to. Uh, their male counterparts. I mean, he's had at least two or three recent examples of that. So that happens all the time, uh, HR Venkatesh. I mean, uh, one is, of course, if you're a woman, second, if you're an opinionated woman, and uh, Muslim women journalists, I think, get the worst uh, trolling, get the worst abuses compared to many of us. So I think it's different levels this happens. But let me also say that, uh, see, this whole weaponizing of uh, of uh, abuse, right? That's what the digital rules are also doing now. What the digital rules are doing is that they are allowing people, like for example, if we write a story and there are thousand people who have, who have a problem with the story and they simply abuse your social media, you can mute those people and go ahead and lie. 
and move ahead, move ahead in life. But what the digital rules is doing is that it is giving a platform for these people to weaponize these complaints and send it uh, to us, to the media house or to the art uh, and object to that article or that news story or that video or whatever. Yes, I mean, the weaponizing is, is really scary. Uh, and we'll come back to that if we have the time, but NGR, you know, uh, there's so many questions one would like to ask you, uh, not the least what uh, Danya referred to as well, but Asia Net is one of the few TV channels that actually faced a blackout uh, for 48 hours, along with the other channel that you run. Now, there is that, and then there is also the fact that the people who, uh, uh, who criticize the central government, the CPIM, for doing this, later on also uh, boycotted you. So, and now you have the BJP that is boycotting, boy, boycotting you again. So now I don't know really what, what to, what for you to focus on, but I'll ask you, um, after that shutdown, uh, it's been more than a year, a year and two, three months. Has it had the effect that it intended? Was, did, did it silence you? Has anything that you do, has it changed? Again, you'll also have to unmute MGR. Well, this this has become a ritual now. Unmute it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Venkatesh, and hi, Tanya, and hi, Siddharth. So, uh, I think uh, before I come to what you ask, I think this could be, it can't be a more apt day uh, than today to take stock of the freedom of the press in the country because this is the 45th anniversary of the proclamation of the internal emergency by Srimati Indira Gandhi. This is the 45th year. So after 45 years, when you look back, what is the state of the press? Absolutely uh, disappointing. As you said, the Freedom House Index um, shows where we are. Now the Freedom of the Press Index also shows that we are never in a in a rosy state of affairs. So, so things are pretty bad, if not worse, in, in, in India. But the most important thing is, as you also mentioned, you know, it, this has become a universal thing because, as everybody knows, you know, the the, the uh, you know you you're faced with a particular irony. You know, there is an increasing trust and uh, you know reach for the media, especially after the pandemic. But you also see the increasing intolerance uh, from governments across. Uh, the, across countries, you have, you know, uh, especially in certain countries, and uh, India also, you know about, you know, until now it's been intimidation, you know, pressures, and you know, as they say, it is censorship by voice. But in the last three months, you are seeing some extremely unprecedented draconian legislation coming up. Uh, you know, first. Uh, was the you know IT amendment act where you are going to muscle the OTTs? Then uh, is coming the cinematograph act amendment where you are going to, in spite of having a full fledged sense about, you are giving authority uh, to the government to the MIB to you know to to to, to sort of uh, uh, you know use the sense of stick. And thirdly, which is going to affect us directly, is the cable TV amendment where you have uh, you know a three tier governance system and oversight system, but ultimately the buck is going to stop at the government level. So this is very, 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 uh, uh, you know, extremely frightening, but not that these, you know, this, as you said, these rights, these powers have been there with the MIB uh, throughout uh, its history, because as you, uh, you and Tanya mentioned uh, last year, uh, you mentioned that in the last uh, March in 2020, we were taken off air by using a particular, uh, you know, section of the cable, um, uh, cable TV Act. Now it's further amended to give it more teeth, as it were. You have the statutory power given to an interdepartmental committee, where uh, you know you can take action, you can take off, uh, take television channels off air uh, by the by the government. It can take state time if you know what the first tier and second tier. Hybrid. Uh, you know, grievance uh, redressal system is not, uh, you know, if, if a particular person doesn't find, uh, you know, the, 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 the solution or the answer is not good enough, they can go directly to the interdepartment committee where the president secretary will be heading. So it's a typical 1984 situation that is coming here. So this is extremely frightening, extremely scary 
as things go uh, for the freedom of the press. Now, uh, yes. what you asked is the last since the last year. You know, uh, no. since I, I would like to say that you know nothing uh, terrible has happened in the last one year. But as you mentioned, you know now what we face besides the, the you know the kind of uh, strong hand tactics by the governments. What you see in Kerala, I don't know about other states, is that the political parties themselves are becoming extremely intolerant in the sense that they are they're not just boycotting television channels, boycotting media. They're even asking, uh, you know, media, you know, those people who uh, are not uh, the media organizations of, of their liking, they're asking us to sort of keep out from the press conference. In fact, isn't it news uh, correspondents have been kept out by ordered out as it were from the press conferences uh, being held by the BJP leaders now. And the worst of all is that even the BJP minister, the central minister, is, has actually, you know, that we, you can understand political party leaders taking this position, but the minister who is under oath uh, uh, to, yes. to, to, you know, to, to keep away from all kinds of discrimination is actually has asked us, Passionate News alone, to keep out of his press conferences. So this is terrible. In fact, in the um, this has never happened before. And as you said, last year it was the CPIM uh, which boycotted our debates. They, they 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 stopped coming for our discussions and debates for three months. After which they you know themselves uh, sort of did this uh, this thing and they started coming back again. Their complaint was that they were not given equal time uh, as their rival political political panelists in the discussions. Now this year it is the BJP. In a, in a way, it's quite gratifying to see that you know both sides have uh, you know taken this kind of position to us. So in in a way, it, it vindicates our position because we are in a way we are happy that we are being hit from both sides. Uh, but because you know as what he said, uh, as Raj Kamal Shah said some time back, it's a, it's a badge of honor that you're, 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 you're on the wrong side of both the left, the, both, both the politics, both the political, you know, parties of, the, uh, of both the spectrum. So in a way, it is good. But, but the point is that governments, political parties, other organizations, and, and worst of all, the vigilantism that you have seen in the political field, you know, the more clinching kind of things that you see. This is exactly what is happening to uh, journalists because the people have themselves, a section of people themselves are taking up on themselves to settle scores with the media people uh, who are actually uh, trying to criticize them, who are, who, are, who are actually, you know. So this is something which has, Dhania said, you know, this kind of trolling, that trolling against especially women journalists. We had this experience of, our executive editor, Sindhu Suri Kumar, who uh, once, you know, holding, uh, she held a uh, debate in which you know, she said something about it and somebody, the BJP was not happy with whatever it is. So there will be con for continuous, for days together, she has attacked left and right and she could have telephone, never had a break for at least um, one or two weeks uh, together. And yes. recently we had this uh, woman correspondent who was, in fact, she did a wrong thing by saying not quite, uh, you know, when somebody asked you know, about something in the display that she gave was not quite good. In fact, that's right. You know, we uh, we ourselves have said, you know, that was a wrong thing to do. We must have regret. But in spite of that, you know, she was trolled, abused, threatened with rape, threatened with murder. And it was this particular reason that made the BJP state leadership boycott us. The BJP leaders asking us to keep off their meetings. The BJP minister at the center keeping us out of the press conference. So this is something which is new and which is extremely worse than in the past. Yeah, and thanks for that. I think uh, from all three of your opening comments, we've actually painted a very brief picture uh, and each comment, we can talk about it for hours, right? each particular point. So I think what I'll do instead is I'll take some questions from, uh, you know, some comments are coming in. Uh, you know, we've also seen, of course, that uh, what happened at Apple News in Hong Kong uh, is an extreme example of what can happen. And I, I know that in having tracked uh, journalism in Russia, uh, and I, I've seen that more than two dozen laws, some of them not even having anything to do with journalism have been amended or changed or introduced in the last uh, you know few years more than two dozen laws and it's increasingly becoming difficult to be a journalist in, in russia 
So as we get questions in, I want to ask you, I mean, I would like you to restrict your answers to 30 seconds, maybe, which is what can be done to help you in this fight? Because, you know, we can continue painting the picture, the grim picture that exists for our profession. But let's also talk about what can people do to help you. So, Siddharth, can you can you tell us your thoughts on that and then, and then I'll, I'll take some questions. I think uh, the what would be helpful is first and foremost for the media fraternity to recognize the fact that we're all in the same boat here, and that whatever our differences uh, of uh, you know medium or language, or in many cases political inclinations and leanings of individual journalists, uh, an attack on press freedom is something we should concern us all, and uh, you, you know one shouldn't uh, hesitate to support. Uh, journalists, when they come under fire, uh, because you say you like the government in power in that particular state, you like or don't like a particular journalist. I think that there needs to be absolute clarity that the this bell which is tolling will one day toll for you. Uh, secondly, uh, I think courts need to be more responsive. Uh, we are fortunate in general for the higher courts to uh, have stood by press freedom over the past 70 years. Uh, perhaps they need to uh, uh, be more um, speedy in their response because the, the the magnitude and gravity of the threats have multiplied ferociously over the last few years. And uh, I think even even the lower judiciary needs to recognize the reality of what's going on and not simply allow the police to get away with the uh, you know uh, completely fabricated charges, uh, which is often the case. Uh, and you know, so a journalist has to go to a higher court to get relief because she is not able to get that relief at the lower court. So I think this is something which is important. Danya? So I just want to add to the first point which Siddharth said that media, no matter whether it's television, print or digital, and no matter what their inclinations are political or otherwise, you just have to realize that today's one government behaving in, in a certain manner. If we do not if we do not condemn it and if we allow it, then the next government would have further impunity. So it's for all of us to remember that we have to stand together and ask for and fight for freedom of speech. I think we also need more movements and uh, other than, of course, courts stepping in. I also feel that we need to have judicial movements. We need people to understand that archaic laws like sedition should be removed in this country, that there is no place for laws like sedition, and we need to have more dialogue around it. We need more common people to participate. I also feel that uh, we should do more to make people understand that whether it's the IT rules that strike at the heart of press freedom, whether it's governments and the police trying to clamp down on media freedoms, eventually the people who suffer are those who are consumers of this news, are those who live in the country. So if governments, police, etc., force media to self-censor, if they are clamping down on this media, or if they bring in something like an IT rule, which will eventually, I believe, lead many media houses to self-censor, the only person who will lose in this battle at the end of the day is the common man. And as long as that knowledge is there, and I'm saying this not only in the context of media, look at what the government is trying to do to OTT platforms, uh, to uh, movies, censorship, etc. In all of these avenues, it is a common man who's going to suffer. So as long as that, you know, that realization is there, I think we can have more voices of who will ask for freedom of speech, who will fight for it. And all of us, I think, should, you know, we should actually strive together to ensure that people understand what the implications are of such sort of clampdown or laws or whatever it is. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll come to you both again uh, for what more can be done within the industry to help uh, journalism, and especially between TV, print, and uh, digital. There's a question, MGR. I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, on this. Someone says, "How does journalism and freedom get impacted by the media? That is, depending on which medium it is, TV, print, etc." We've spoken about the IT rules and uh, other rules, how they impact digital news. We've spoken about the Cable uh, News Act and the Cinematography Act, uh, you know, impacting television. How about print? I mean, if you can put on the hat of the former print journalist that you are, how does print get censored and what is the way forward? Well, I think, uh, you know, for 
some strange reason now in india as the entire media sphere print appears to be the only uh, you know branch uh, of stream which does not uh, have any pre censorship as such because you have this in movies you have this in digital you have something is coming up for the cable tv uh, in fact print is still uh, sort of immune to this kind of things but i don't know how long it's going to last because there will be definitely ideas and uh, you know proposals from 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 the powers to be how to take uh, the entire thing to the world of print also but as of now the print is relatively free and there are no legislation at least now in the horizon as the well print is concerned i don't know how far it is going to last but that's the situation right now okay i mean i this is one thing i read about uh, print which is that uh, there's a lot of pressure indirect pressure brought on print yeah uh, in terms of um, you know government advertising uh, advertisements tenders and and all that uh, what has happened to the dainik basket group for example uh, I, i'll actually toss that to siddharth siddharth uh, from your perspective as the former editor of the hindu do you think print is slightly better off or we are all in the same boat it's just that the tides are you know different on the sea is different no uh, print is uh, is the best is best in terms of uh, government intrusion because again news is subjected to you know uh, a whole and uh, there are no it rules for 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 print newspapers right uh, and the rules apply to their websites uh which is uh, which they are opposing and and they should oppose it uh but newspapers come under the press council of india and the press council of india's oversight is uh i would say compatible with the constitutional team of the press and uh, uh you know rather than leveling the playing field in the direction of greater and greater control and i think newspapers should realize but if the government is allowed to create this new playing field citing the alleged lack of regulation or lack of, uh, uh you know rules for uh, for digital news uh, eventually this system this playing field will become a common playing playing field for everybody already tv news which had assumed that they would be exempt from you know because the, until now the tv channels have not had to have grievance officers and keep a keep a log of complaints received and so on and so forth right now under the latest notification television news channels are also subjected to this and i would say unless we all as an industry oppose the it rules and the mentality behind it the day is not far when the press of india act or some other legislative intervention uh, will uh, will be foisted down the throats of newspapers compelling them also to appoint grievance officers and respond to uh, grievances that they get within a time bound uh, period and then uh, uh, a government a peer sector committee of ministerial interministerial committee taking the final call so newspapers today have uh, the greatest degree of freedom and radio radio news has the least and uh, in between are digital platforms and television but i think that this government and the mentality it has Uh, is going to ensure that uh, everybody is uh, everybody's rights uh, and you know the free press is going to be throttled and newspapers are not going to be exempt or immune from this okay uh danya and ngr i want to uh, you know siddharth has spoken about the up government and uh, we have we've spoken about obviously the rules uh, and the acts the various acts in the legal system that impact print tv and uh, and digital what about state governments dhanya um you know you, the news minute reports on all the southern states and you had multiple different ideologically committed governments is it a tendency of government to do this because we've seen there is a tendency in government to muzzle free, uh, freedom of the press but some governments are worse off than the others when it comes to this what would you say to that of course some governments are definitely worse than the others for example uh, in the previous tamil nadu government when jayalalitha was the chief minister you have seen how defamation notices were given at the drop of a hat the dmk2 did but at a much 
lesser quantity than uh, Jayalalitha. Like, for example, last year when we had reported on how private medical colleges, uh, I mean, when private hospitals did not have enough uh, beds as the government was claiming, we got a notice on the Epidemic Disease Act uh, from the Chennai Police Commissioner. Uh, and I raised it with the police commissioner saying that what was wrong in the story? I mean, uh, we have called up each of these hospitals and they did not have the uh, number of beds which the government was claiming. So after I told him that we have recorded all these calls, they did not go ahead with the case. So we've had several examples where uh, we have got notices, but I think uh, by and large, um, I mean, I'm sure maybe MGR would disagree, but as far as digital media is concerned, I think from the Southern governments, from the five governments here, uh, the retaliation has been much lesser, but uh, for example, the Telangana chief minister KCR, uh, he has he has brought down television channels for many months. For example, there was an unofficial ban on two television channels. They could not be telecast in Telangana, I think, for more than a year. And it was an unofficial ban. The cable TV network just would not telecast these channels. So there are different ways in which these governments or these politicians operate. Some of them, of course, file cases or they will intimidate you on social media. But of course, there are people like KCR who have other methods. Um, Digital, by and large, has been sort of left uh, alone by the southern governments. There have been cases filed, like the uh, the Coimbatore one, which Bihar mentioned, where the editor was arrested. There have been some cases, but I feel it's been much better than what the wire has faced with the UP government. Way better. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, MGR. We, I mean, it's it's really. Uh, we're laughing because the situation is so grim, not because it's funny. Uh, and yeah, um, we've spoken about all of this, but what about uh, journalism in the languages? I mean, Malayalam, but also, uh, I also want uh, Siddharth and Zanya to weigh in because they operate non-English as well, uh, in non-English spaces as well. What do you think there is more freedom of the press? Because I, I mean, I do know that to a large extent, uh, the discourse is more sophisticated when it comes to non-English languages in India, in some respects, and in some some respects, it isn't. So, would you say press freedom is a problem, a greater problem in the languages, or a lesser problem? Well, I think I don't know whether it is less or greater, but there, there is, even in spite of all these differences, there are differences in degrees. But this universal tendency, uh, or the contemporary tendency of the states to acquire more power, to be more intolerant, to muscle the press, is something which cuts across political parties and regions and all of this kinds of things. This is an international global thing. But at the same time, there is difference in degrees. You know, the central government's uh, recent legislations are absolutely draconian. There is nothing remotely even, you know, similar to some something that is happening in, in a state like Kerala. But there has been a, a major effort even in Kerala also. Even this the last LDF government uh, period, it's a few months back, you know, the, the state government brought about, tried to bring about, an, through an ordinance, uh, a police act, which is absolutely draconian. And some of the things that are abominable to that, only because there's a huge controversy, a huge debate, and it triggered a major uh, protest in the state that they decided to repeal that ordinance, even after the governor actually signed it. So, but so the tendency to 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 acquire more power is something which is some which is uh, you know which cuts across all uh, ideologies. So, but I think as Tanya said, things are better in South definitely because of various other reasons because of its different historical uh, background for that, the tradition, the literacy, the vibrant media, and all these things have actually contributed to that. Uh, but uh, Things are just, but this tendency is definitely there unless we make a huge uh, sort of shout. This, even in spite of all this political ideological differences, the governments have sense. And also, we we see in Kerala also this kind of the the, the, the you know the political leaders' uh, attitudes uh, to sort of to keep away from press conferences. Our chief minister, uh, you know, only after the corona. Epidemic came that the chief minister started having press conference. Before that, he had stopped holding press conferences. He doesn't give interviews to us. So this is something which is uh, the same thing that you see in Delhi. So uh, this, uh, you know, this attempt to delegitimize, as Hanya said, delegitimize the media, 
the mainstream media especially and to go to this uh, you know this uh, you know one way traffic media kind of you know you have monthly bar there you have something the, the facebook post uh, by the chief minister so this this uh, you know he, this hesitation to 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 to, to sort of have a have a, a kind of a direct interaction with the media is also getting increasingly prevalent everywhere so i yes. think this um, uh, I, i think in spite of definitely there are differences in the degrees but the tendency is common okay i can just uh, add here let's it's not very, i mean things are definitely better but not very rosy in fact today the bjp has sent a 100 crore notice to tamil newspaper called dinamalar for a story that they did a source based story saying that there were sexual uh, harassment allegations against a bjp leader and ct ravi the bjp leader from karnataka who is in charge of tamil nadu he held a meeting in which he spoke about it and that a vishakha committee may have to be set up this is what this is what the newspaper report said now the bjp has sent a legal notice uh, to the uh, newspaper but my question is instead of actually addressing whether the party has a vishakha committee or not the first thing that they do is to send a legal notice last year we saw at least 3 to 4 months many tamil news anchors being continuously targeted especially by the bjp again here where one news anchor guna uh, from news 18 was forced to quit after he was hounded for days and weeks for his journalism so these kind of things are happening but but i'm hoping uh, that there is more awareness already uh, in certain states and that will help and like i said educating and convincing the public that de legitimizing the media only helps certain government certain politicians and that the public should not be a party to it at that kind of a media literacy that kind of knowledge amongst the public is the only thing which can really help us all and we should all be part of that process actually that's an interesting comment and i want to, uh, as we get into closing comment uh, sidar if you have anything to add to this in conclusion but also a very specific question do you think that increasingly there is a need to not just report the news but also teach your readers how to view what is going on media literacy as uh, danya mentioned well a certain amount essential uh, because you have so much fake news going around and social media has uh, magnified uh, the volume and also increased the velocity with which this material circulates so uh, you know teaching people but not in a kind of didactic fashion but i think simply through uh, through good example right uh, so in other words when when we put up a credible report about uh, an issue which people have been misinformed or been subjected to disinformation via social media or on whatsapp uh, we hope that this uh, um, raises uh, the consciousness and level of awareness of of average readers as to how they should approach uh, information that they receive uh, and what kind of basic checks and balances should they should they apply in in dealing with with news i what purpose to be news uh, so yes i think that there is there has to be an element of of uh, media literacy that uh, and and you know maybe if media organizations themselves aren't doing it but a group the you know boom live or op news others uh, i think uh, one of the great uh innovations in indian journalism has been the rise of fact checking websites uh it doesn't surprise me that they too are being targeted right so so uh, alt news one of their founding editors has been uh, subjected to an fir uh, and you know uh, perhaps increasingly this is going to be the case because don't forget that fake news is not something which is emerging in the abstract fake news is the product of uh of a political you know interests uh, and you have political parties who have ip cells who literally fabricate uh, photographs who who or fabricate narratives based on doctored videos uh, and we've seen plenty of this right so uh, uh, and in, in inevitably when we debunk that uh, as we've been doing uh, as twitter attempted to do in one case there will be backlash and the assault that we are seeing on on media today uh, will uh, will also be evident will also take the form of an assault on the fact checkers and we need to be prepared for this okay got it 
Uh, last comments again, uh, and uh, this one area we didn't really uh, go into, but I'm going to briefly touch upon it. I'll ask you, Dhanya, before coming to you, MGR. You know, unlike uh, uh, television and print, digital media is kind of one advantage uh, we have is we can go directly to the reader. And I know, of course, the wire is supported by reader contributions, as is the news minute. Is that one particular? Is that one potential way? You know, you get financial support from readers which will enable you to continue to practice the kind of journalism that you want to, and also fight all these attempts at censorship. Danya, this is for you, but if Siddharth, if you want to interject also. Clearly, I mean, uh, what we have seen over the years is that the revenue models of both television channels and uh, newspapers are heavily dependent on governments, right? On government advertisements, etc. And understandably, because these media houses are not charity houses, they have to make money, they have to pay salaries. <laughs> They have to self censor quite a bit, which is why I feel that the revenue models of most uh, digital outlets uh, allows them to be more independent. We are all smaller uh, in numbers. We are asking the readers, the consumers of news to actually understand the value of what they're reading and take membership, subscription, donation, etc. Because when uh, media houses do not have to uh, indirectly or directly depend on any kind of revenue from the government. There is definitely a degree of independence that that is uh, obviously there. So, which is why I believe the revenue model, which most media houses, most digital media house in India are following, including the wire news laundry or the quint or the news minute will help us further because that's the only way out, right? Readers have to realize that they have to also pay for the news that they read. And that's the only way to keep news independent. Yeah. MGR, uh, you know, you, 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 in a, in a sense, you're like, uh, protected from the, not protected, I guess that's the wrong way of putting it, but you can't go to the reader, for example, not necessarily, uh, for financial contributions. So how would you fight? How would you fight? What, what would help you to fight? this kind of censorship and attempts to muzzle the news? Well, I don't, uh, well, this is a time tested uh, sort of strategy is to keep shouting. That is all because we have, we have absolutely nothing else to do. We just yeah. keep shouting from the rooftops about we are being done. This is being done. But unfortunately, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, the public now these days because I always thought, you know, there'll be finally you go to the people they're going to help you. But off late, what you see is a tendency of people, you know, getting completely, you know, this vigilantism is taking a hold over the people themselves because people, a large sections of people, in spite of the fact that they know that the one particular media organization is extremely biased, they're saying lies, they seem to support, they seem to subscribe to this. I think this is a typical post-truth situation where people you know, even if they know that, you know, one particular media organization, one particular media is what, what they are saying is wrong, there is a tendency for large sections of people to keep loyal, keep to being loyal to that particular organization. The latest, uh, you know, this um, Reuters report is actually an eye opener in the sense that the media organization, which is pretty extremely low in terms of trust of the people, is pretty high in terms of reach. So why is this? I think there's, there is a, there is a, there, you know, there's a complete transformation in the way people see media, people see truth, people see right and wrong. So there is a huge churning happening inside the society. So I think even if you are, you know, even if people know that what you are saying is right, people tend to look the other way because they think that, you know, for various other reasons, because they're, you know, ideological, maybe communal or whatever it is. So I think I'm, becoming slightly skeptical about people's perspective. People's Understand. Understood. Understood. Yeah. You know, I actually you mentioned the Reuters report uh, and the wire is, is cited as one of the most trusted uh, brands in India and also a certain other channel, an infamous TV channel whose name I will not take. So, but the reach, just, reach is high. The reach is high. Yes, that is true. That is true. Uh, so I think we're pretty much, uh, you know, we have five minutes left. I was told we have five minutes left uh, about a minute ago. And there, were, there was a question about uh, how social media, the impact of social media on journalistic efforts. Uh, if anyone wants to take it, you're welcome. I just want to say that, you know, social media also amplifies journalism, but at the same time gives people a weapon to beat media. You know, social media just essentially uh, increases the power of the mob 
to concentrate their efforts against the media, exactly. whether it is an organization or if it is an individual journalist. Uh, uh, okay, so just to finish things off, uh, I want to check. Uh, Siddharth, I don't know if you can hear me. Does international uh, pressure help? Uh, journalists from international, international journalists, international journalism organizations, uh, you know, maybe even governments. Is that a, is that a help or is that a bugbear? I think Siddharth is not here. So he, uh, I think the internet issues, uh, there are internet issues. So Danya, I just want to know, you know, you, you can have support from people in India, but what about outside India? Does that help or does it actually detract? Because if people say, wow, you know, we should support what this news minute is saying, then the government is, will say, look at this. These are agents of the West or agents of foreign government. So I'm uh, very scared uh, if any Pakistani handle retweets me. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It has happened to me so many times where some random Pakistani handle will take a tweet and they will put it out and they'll and there'll be hundred others saying Dhanya is part of the anti-breaking India voices, which is why Pakistanis are retweeting. And I'm like, Pakistanis, stop retweeting me. But yes, I mean, see, these are all perceptions, uh, HR Venkatesh. I mean, I initially I used to take all this very seriously around seven to eight years ago. I used to shudder when there were, you know, hashtags against us or when people were trolling me and abusing me. But these days, I think most of us are chill. We understand that this job comes with a certain risk, especially if you are a woman, it comes with a higher risk. The only problem uh, I, I uh, find as an editor is that when things go beyond a level, when there are threats of rape, of sexual harassment, of physical violence, especially um, to my junior colleagues, and they have not you know, encountered something like this ever before. It takes a huge toll on them, both on their mental health, their physical health, and even their work style, working style. So as editors, I think our constant job is also to tell people who work in our organizations that the echo chambers around you, you can only take them this seriously, that beyond a point, they cannot impact your journalism. Your journalism has to carry on as it is. And whether it's people yeah. from inside India or outside India supporting you, it doesn't really matter. You continue doing your work. Yes, I think that's a great note to end this uh, conversation on. Uh, we've got to take care of our mental health and uh, journalism organizations uh, can use a lot of help when it comes to individual reporters requiring that, acquiring rather that ability to chill out, as uh, as Nanya said, and also taking steps to protect uh, ourselves, you know, not put in, putting out personal information on the internet, doxing yourself, those kinds of things, for example just to see that you're safe. Uh, so I think we can conclude there. It's been a fantastic conversation. Siddharth uh, is not here, of course, but thank you to Siddharth. And also thank you to MGR and Dhanya and IAMAI. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Insightful session, sir. So that was really insightful. And I believe that uh, all of us had certain key takeaways to take, uh, uh, take from this. And I would like to thank all the panelists and the moderators on the behalf of IAMAI for joining us today and sharing some key insights. And special thanks to our knowledge partner, Kantar. So I would request all the delegates to stay tuned. We will be back with the next session in uh, about 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay.